Nothing like a little technical difficulty to start the set, right, guys? Yeah. If you would this morning, stand with us and let's praise the Lord. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness and whose love is mighty and so much stronger? King of glory, the King of all names. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? King of glory, the King King. This is an amazing place. This is an amazing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos Back into order And who makes the orphan A son and daughter The king of glory The king of glory Who rules the nations with truth and justice and shines like the sun in all its brilliance? The King of glory, the King of all kings.
seated. Praise the Lord that he breaks chains. Amen. Hopefully we all have testimonies and some chains he broke in us. So if you hadn't had them broke, just go to him. He'll take care of them. Amen. Those things that hold us down. So well, it's good to see you in the house of the Lord today as we gather together in his house and worship together and be able to come together. I don't know about you, but that just does something for your week when you're around God's people and around God's encouraging people to be able to make it through the next week. So we praise God for our church. We also praise God for those that have joined us for the first time. We welcome you to Believer's Fellowship for such a time as this, and we're glad that you're here. As you came in, you should have received one of the welcome cards. If you didn't, there's some in the pockets in the chairs in front of you, so if you'll grab one of those and fill that out, we'd appreciate it. Feel free to put a prayer request on there as well where we can be lifting up something that you're going through that you want the church to be praying for you. Just write that in as well, and then at the end of the service, we'll remind you we have a free gift that we'd like to give you for being uh, our very special guest. So hang on to that card, and we'll remind you about that in just, just a moment at the end. So, But our folks want to welcome you uh, to our service. So if you're a very first-time guest, if you'll just uh, relax and remain seated right where you are. Members, regular attenders, get up from where you are, find someone that's seated. your way back to your seats uh, if you'd stay standing uh, this is the time in our service that we read the scripture so in honoring of God's word if you'll stay standing uh, we've asked Rebecca to come and read this morning's scripture Genesis 45 4 
Then Joseph said to his brothers, Please come closer to me. And they came closer. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in this land for two years. And there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. Now, therefore, it was not you who sent me here, but God, and he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his household and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we come before you and God, we just want to be still and know that you're God. And Father, as we gather together to worship, and Lord, as we gather together to hear your word, we gather together to pray and encourage each other, Lord, and all the things that we do in your house, Father, we pray that, God, our hearts and our minds would be focused on you, Lord, that we don't miss one thing that you have for us, Lord. God, as we come before you, Lord, we have so much to be thankful for, even in the midst of difficulty, Lord. We see your divine provision, your divine guidance, your divine help. So, Father, we call upon you right now, Father, to be glorified in this service. God, that our full attention would be focused on you and your word and your worship. And may you, God, and you alone be the one that receives all the glory, praise, and honor, for it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's stay standing as we worship the Lord. Y'all can actually be seated. We're going to do a special uh, original song for y'all.
next song we're going to do for you all is called You Know My Name. And maybe as you're sitting here this morning, you feel forgotten. Maybe you feel like God forgot about you. Maybe you feel forgotten. And I want you to know this morning as we sing this song that God is here in this place and he never left you. He's with you. He says, if you call upon me and seek me with your whole heart, I will be found.
already does, amen, he knows us by name. Amen, this morning we're continuing on our same study that we started two weeks ago on living with divine purpose, and we talked about uh, King David, and he wasn't king then when he went up against Goliath, but uh, we looked at how his life was a life of divine purpose. He had a purpose, and that was at that time to take out Goliath which was hindering the people of God from going forward. And now we're going to be looking at the life of, uh, of Joseph. You know, I don't believe a lot of believers are living with divine purpose. And that's what we've been called to do. You know you've been saved, the scripture says in Ephesians, unto good works. In other words, there's something you've been saved for other than just getting you into heaven. All right, four of us agree with that. You know, that you don't get just saved so you can get to heaven. We have a purpose, a divine purpose for God to use us in this world for such a time as this. Until you die, you have a purpose. And most people are just saying, I'm just going through life. And they don't have their divine purpose settled in life. You know, last week we gave a little illustration about kind of how that was with the cell phone. I believe another illustration was the lady that... Her husband died and she wanted some companionship, so she bought a parakeet, you know, so we could, she could have something to talk to and talk back. And so she went to the pet store and bought it and the guy said, hey, it'll, in a few weeks it'll start talking. Well, it didn't. She took, went back and said, well, it's not talking. Said, well, you may need to buy one of these mirrors, put it in the cage and then it can look at itself and maybe it'll help encourage it to talk. So she did. Came back in two weeks, <clears throat> still hadn't talked. So what you need is this little ladder. Put this ladder in his cage and then he'll get a little more exercise going up to the mirror and that may get encouragement to talk. And so she did that, came back. He still doesn't talk. Well, here you need this little swing. Put this little swing in the cage and then he'll swing and then eventually he'll get so relaxed and whatever then he'll probably talk. She comes back in two weeks and said, he's dead. And she said, he, the owner of the pet shop said, he's dead? What do you mean he's dead? She said, well, right before he died, he got out one sentence. And what was that? He said in a real soft voice, don't they sell any food at that pet store? <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get that now. You see, life to him was more than the mirror. More than the ladder, more than the swing, what was most important was food. And that's how we live our life. We're doing the swings of life, the ladders of life, the mirrors of life. And we've left out the main thing, the food. And no wonder the Christian's dying off. Because they're just existing, not living with divine purpose. And our last words may be, why didn't I do my purpose? And then we go. What a shame that would be at the end of our life, that we live life, but we didn't live life with purpose, with a, a divine purpose. You, know, you have purpose at work. They give you a job description, don't they? Hopefully they do. You don't go to work and say, I have no idea what I'm supposed to do here. You say, well, we got a few employees like that. But anyway, you should have a purpose so that you know what you're expected to do, and we have that in life here. So this time we're going to be looking like we did a couple of weeks ago at the life of uh, David. Let's look at the life of uh, Joseph. Of course, there's a few of these, these passages are so long with Joseph, we'll have to be doing a few little Reader's Digest versions, but we'll get the whole just of the divine purpose. Number one, he did not let the actions of others keep him from fulfilling his divine purpose. That's very important. A lot of people allow the actions of others to keep them from fulfilling their divine purpose. Oh man, this one's a, a big one here. Now Israel loved Joseph, that was Joseph's dad, more than all of his sons. A little side note there, don't pay favorites with your children. He made him a very colored tunic. His brothers saw that their father loved him more than all of his brothers, and because of that, they hated him. His brothers hated him. That's strong language there. They could not stand Joseph. And so because of this, it led to many more things. Listen to this in Proverbs. Wrath is fierce, 
Anger is a flood, but who can stand before jealousy? Listen, if you want to know something that will cause more trouble in your life, even more than anger or wrath, it's jealousy. If you haven't dealt with it, you will. If it hadn't been done against you, it will. Because what this verse is saying is wrath is a bad dude getting wrath on people. And anger, that's a bad dude. But none of them compare. Because who can stand before this other little creature? And that's jealousy. And it doesn't take much for that to rise up and be jealous. Oh, oh, he said that to them and not me. Oh, he gave that to them and not me. Oh, they got the promotion and not me. Oh, that happened to them and not me. Oh, that should have been me. I mean, jealousy is just always ready to prounce on you and I. And it pranced on this family. And boy, the devastation that came from one word, jealousy. You know why they went after Jesus? Look up in the scripture. You know what it was? Jealousy. Those religious leaders saw he was getting more attention to them. That was what the spur was. Yeah, it was God's plan that he'd be crucified, but the motivation they had was, wait, we're the big shot spiritually. And now he's getting all the attention. And it said that jealousy drove them. Boy, that's a strong emotion. And if we don't watch it, we're going to allow that to dictate what we do in life, and we shouldn't. And so they decide, hey, you know what we're going to do? We're going to act like we're going to take him when he's out there in the, in the desert, and we're, we're going to go ahead and the one of them attempted to just kill him, but they didn't. They drop, We're getting ready to drop him in a pit and just let him sit there in a pit. Maybe die, we don't know, but we saw something that happened after they did that. And it says, when they threw him in the pit, after they threw him in the pit, and they raised their eyes and looked, behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites. So they take Joseph, they throw him in the pit, and as soon as they throw him in the pit, they raise their eyes and looked, and behold, what just happened to be coming by? Listen, when you're doing sin, let it be known that the devil is right there to help you out with the next step. You think, this must be God. Could you chance that out here in the desert that just a caravan just happened to be coming by at that exact time? A lot of people sin and then they go to the next step of sin because the devil's provided the next step for you. Yes, God used all this, don't get me wrong, to get him where he wanted to get, but let's look at it in the selfish realm. They go, oh, look, behold, here's our answer. And so they sold him to that caravan. And you know what they got for him? 20 shekels of silver. You know what that amounts to? That's the price given for just a crippled servant, a crippled slave. I mean, that, that was, they didn't get much at all for him. Do you know what Joseph must have thought? Is that all I'm worth? Listen, some of you as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, you've been told things about you that you feel like you're not worth anything, that you're just worth 20 shekels of silver. It happens, I talk to people who are adults and things that were said or done when they were a child, they're already dealing with self-confidence, about self-worth, about who they are and what they can do. They've been told you're a failure. They've been told you can't do anything. They've been told they've been seeing failures and failures and failures after their life. And they think, you know, all I'm worth is 20 shekels of silver. Price of a crippled slave. That's life. That's life that we've been sold a bill of goods that what others tell we are, that's who we are. But it's who God says we are is who we are. And you're worth more than a 20 seconds of silver. You're priceless because Christ died on the cross for you and I. You know what? This could have been the end of Joseph. If they say I'm just worth 20 seconds of silver, then I'm going to live my rest of my life that way. And I'm just going to be depressed and down, and the rest of my life will be focused on people that hate me. Has anybody been done wrong, more wrong than Joseph? Has anybody's brothers or sisters sold them into slavery? Let me see a show of hands. I see none. Nobody's been that mean to us that they would sell us our own family. You can see some stranger, you know, shot somebody or some stranger did that. But this was their own flesh and blood that sold them in there. And so he has been done so wrong 
more wrong than any of us could ever experience, and been told you're only worth 20 shekels of silver. That would end most people's divine purpose right there. They say, I'm done. I'm not going to have any part to do with anything else, and this could have ended it all, and many people it does end it all. We've got to know that our self-worth is in Christ and not what other people say. A lot of people can never get past this. You know, they're 80 years old, 90 years old, 100 years old, and what people have said and claimed and done has become their self-worth. But it didn't with Joseph. I, I know that hurt him as much as it did would do me and you. <laughs> All of that, the hatred and whatever, but he, he walked past it and fulfilled all of his divine purpose I believe God had for him. The second is he stayed faithful and experienced God's presence and favor encouraging him to press on to fulfill his divine purpose. He, he went on, he pressed on because he was, he was faithful. We know that once he did arrive in Egypt he was sold to Potiphar's house and became a slave. And so here he is Goes from this family, now he's a slave. And it says, the Lord was with Joseph. Now his master saw that the Lord was with Joseph. And now the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight and became his personal servant. And he made him overseer over his house. And all that he owned, he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in the house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. See, the, remember we talked about with David. David, remember when he went up against that Philistine, he said, that's just an uncircumcised Philistine. He meant he's not part of the covenant. covenant. He's not part of God's family. We can take him down. Same way with Joseph. Hey, the Lord's with me. I'm, with, I'm in covenant with the Lord. Uh, I'm, he, I'm part of his family. Uh, I'm, in, I'm in his divine authority because he's with me. You know, even David in the psalm said, I'm not going to fear for the Lord's with me. He's, he was with Joseph. That, that made the difference in his life and he stayed faithful to him and he got favor. I don't know about you, I need favor. You ever had somebody say, can I do you a favor? I don't know anybody that said, no, you can't do me a favor. <laughs> don't we want favor from people? You know, uh, like the, the government or some business or whatever. We want God to char cause us to have favor. And he did because he was with Joseph. But listen to this. He was in a bad situation as a slave. But you know what? He was the best slave that he could ever be. A lot of people, I'm at work, I don't like it. I'm doing this, but I'm just going to do this for a while. I'm doing that. Or just Be the best you can be. Be the best student you can be. Be the best servant you can be. Be the best church worker you can be. Be the best child you can be. Be the best parent you can be. Be the best employer you can be. Be the best in what you do. You say, well, maybe that really doesn't have to link to ministry. Oh, yes, it does. This was all he could do was to be a good slave. And he was such a good slave, the guy said, man, I'm going to make you the top slave. You are in charge of everything in my house because you're so faithful. Is that what they tell you where you are? Man, you're just a faithful person. You're just a faithful person. Well, he was, and God caused people to show favor upon him. God did that. Well, that's how we can obtain our purpose because God, when we submit to him, he has his purpose and favor, and he's with us. We're covenant with him, and he allows other people to do favors for us. And then we'll talk about this later. He's wrongly accused. We'll get to that later, but I want to make this point now that when he goes to jail, he ends up going to jail after this incident. We'll kind of fill in between. But the Lord was with Joseph. You mean in jail too? Yeah. And extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the jailer, and the Lord was with him. So no matter what he did, if he was a slave in Potiphar's house, now he goes to jail and he gets favor too because he gets to be the top-notch jail person. He was put as supervisor of the jail because he was so faithful in what he did in jail. He didn't say, oh, I'm just going to do No, what can I do here in the jail? He wanted to serve God in jail. And God 
was with him there and he became the chief jailer. I don't know what that was. I don't know what you do there, but he became chief jailer. He became the chief slave. Now he's the chief jailer. God was saying, and you say, well, that's just Joseph. Somebody will get upset here. The Bible says he's not a respecter of persons. What he does for Joseph, he'll do for me. If we don't believe that, we don't believe the whole Bible. That he wants you to fulfill your divine purpose, and if you'll be faithful in what you do and pursue what his purpose is for your life, he'll be with you, and he'll show you favor. Remember Ezra 6.22, For the Lord has caused them to rejoice, and look what the Lord did, and he turned the heart of the king of Assyria toward them. Wouldn't you love that? Whatever authority you're dealing with, you're just button heads with the boss, the government, a corporation, or whatever. And God said, hey, let me tell this. Done. He just turned the heart of the king. Can you turn the heart of a king? More than likely not. But he can. Whoever you're dealing with, if you'll fulfill your divine purpose, he will turn that authority for you. Paul, he's doing what I can't do. I don't know what you, I, I, I need this. I need God to change people's hearts for me. And he'll do that. Just turn it around. Matter of fact, in Exodus, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. <laughs> he gave them so much favor, they said, y'all need more gold? Here, you can have some of ours. Why would they do that? Because God gave the people favor. It wasn't the people going, oh, look how I look, or what? Well, Somehow, when they approached them, God just made it a miracle for them to show favor upon them. Some people have showed favor on me and you because of not me or you, but because of God intervening, because we were wanting to fulfill God's purpose. And he said, hey, I'm going to make people show favor upon you, not because of you and what you do, because you're going to see it was me. Wow. Turning the hearts of authorities, making people show favor upon you. I don't know about you, that sounds good for me. I want this package. I want this in my life. Don't you? That you're faithful in what you're doing. And if the Lord saw you right now, are you faithful in what you're doing? Are you faithful in what you're doing for the Lord? Are you faithful with your time? Are you faithful with your talents? Are you faithful with your treasures? Are you faithful to serve the Lord? Are you faithful to give to the Lord? Are you faithful in everything that you do that you can serve the Lord? Man, that's what we got to do now. <laughs> Today. We don't know what tomorrow holds. He didn't know what tomorrow holds. This might have been the end of his life. But if it was, he said, I was the best jail, chief jail person that was ever been on the planet. And if I die in jail, that'll be my testimony that I lived for God in jail. He just found the best place to serve the Lord, which was whatever he was. The third point is, he had the right perspective and reaction to temptation and sin in order to fulfill his divine purpose. Look, each of these are going to be necessary if you're going to fulfill your divine purpose in life. I don't care if you're 3 or 13 or 103, we're still fulfilling divine purpose. We never are until the day we meet the Lord. On earth, we're just continuing to fulfill our divine purpose. And we're going to have purpose in heaven, too. We'll get to that later. But we have purpose here on earth no matter what the age. We've got to look at this one, too. All of these are important in life so that we do the main thing. Remember, we're not focused on the mirror thing, the ladder thing, and the swing thing. We're focusing on the food thing. All those other things were good in the cage, but they weren't the most important thing in the cage. The most important thing in the cage was the food. The most important thing in life is fulfilling his divine purpose. And so we see that that was what he had to do next was to do that. Remember, we see in Scripture that Joseph was handsome and in form and appearance. And Potiphar's wife was continually trying to seduce him. Now, now he's in Potiphar's house. He's the top-notch slave. And so now Potiphar's wife is coming on to him to seduce him, to sleep with her day after day after day. And so as she tries to seduce him, look at what his perspective is on sin. How could I do this great evil and sin against God? You know, a lot of people is going, you know, he may be thinking, you know, life's been pretty bad. 
I've been a slave and now the master's gone and I could go ahead and sleep with his wife and he'd never know it and you know nobody would ever know it and I'd enjoy life better because it's been hard on me and difficult and so I'm just going to go ahead and do that because Potiphar will never know, the workers will never know, the rest of the slaves will never know and life will just keep on going. You know what his perspective is? I don't care if anybody else doesn't know. God's going to know, and this will be against him. See, that's what every sin is. Whether anybody else knows it, God knows it. And what a great perspective to get your divine purpose other than saying, you know what, everything I do is really a sin that's evil and, and wrong. It's a sin against God. I need to quit doing this or start doing this or do this because if I don't, it's a sin against God. And so what a great perspective. That allowed him to, you know, it would have stopped right there, I believe. It could have easily stopped right there if he had went ahead and gave in. Now, we're not completely sad. Don't get me wrong. We fail and we mess up and God picks us up and we go on. But it will begin to sidetrack our divine purpose. And he had the right reaction to temptation. As she spoke to Joseph day after day after day, I mean, it just wouldn't stop. You had those kind of temptations that just plague you day after day after. The same sin usually many times, day after day. She just would not give up. So what would the rest of this verse probably say? As she spoke to him day after day, he decided he would sit down and just have conversation with him with her because there's no sin in conversation. That's what a lot of people do. They would try to compromise here. They would take this advantage and say, well, you know, we could just talk. But no. Here's what he said. And did not listen to her or even be beside her Or be with her. You see how you handle temptation? He wasn't even going to listen to her. Now he could have said, it's okay to listen. Where does the Bible say it's wrong to listen? (laughs) The Bible says, make no provision for the flesh is what it says. So if I start listening, then I'll start being beside her. And then I'm going to start being with her. Do you see how that progresses? We in sin cannot even take that first step because the first step makes the second step easier and the third step. And young people, old people, whatever, you better remember this. Mark it down, put it in tablet form and put it in your heart to say, I can't even make that first step. How many people's lives have been changed because they listened and then they were just beside and then they were with, but not Joseph. He said, I'm not doing any of them because one's going to lead to the next one. That's how you handle it. Now it happened one day that when he went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the household were there inside. Oh, what a great opportunity this is is now. Nobody's in the whole house. Not the master, not the servants, not anybody. We got the whole house to ourselves. And she caught him by the garment saying, lie with me. Uh, Now she's catching him. Now she's pulling him by the garment. Now, he could have said, now, hold on. Let's sit and talk about this. You see, the Bible says that sin, remember, she got him by the garment. It's an opportunity to just have a good, wholesome, biblical conversation. wonder how that rest of that verse is going to say. And he left his garment in her hand, and he fled and went outside. Flee is the only biblical model for temptation. A lot of people, I've been saved 42 years, I can handle that. If you've been saved 42 years, you ought to know fleeing better than anybody. You can handle it. You've been saved long enough to know you can't. Yeah, but I've been showing spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity means you run faster and quicker than anybody else in the room. (laughs) There is no, I don't care if you saved 200 years, you cannot handle it, you flee. Get out, go. That's the only, a lot of people say, well, I've been in this here and I'm in this situation. Get out of it. You can handle it. I don't care what the maturity level is. Maturity says, I cannot. 
Matter of fact, 2 Timothy, Paul gives Timothy these instructions now. Flee youthful lust. You say, well, I'm older, but it's still your youthful lust that are still there. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? You may be 80, but you got that 18-year-old youthful lust. It just never goes away. You know what that word flee is? In the Greek, it's flugo, which is where we get our word fugitive. You got to be a fugitive from sin. In other words, I'm going to run, hide, and nobody's going to find me. That's how serious Paul said to take this fleeing. So many people have lost so much by not fleeing. You got to flee. There's just no other way around it. And so he did. And guess what? He's continuing now in his divine purpose. He hadn't let what people say about him stop him. He hadn't placed where he is stop him. He hadn't placed temptation. He hadn't given in there. He's continuing to pursue it. And then he did not let the bad, what I call the bad to worse events derail his commitment to fulfill his divine purpose. First of all, he's hated by his brothers. Then he's sold into slavery. Then he serves as a slave. Then he's wrongly accused of rape. And then he's sent to jail. So Joseph's master took him and put him in jail. <laughs> My goodness. Oh yeah, don't preachers on the radio say if you're living for God, everything just works out perfect. That's lies. It's only going to be health, wealth, and prosperity for you if you're serving the Lord. Well, tell that to Joseph. He said, man, <laughs> is it going to get any worse? So now he's in jail. He's in jail with the, with the, the kings, the, the leaders, cupbearer and baker. And so he you know, ends up cupbearer, you know, ends up uh, uh, not getting, well, they end up getting freed. One gets killed and one lives. And so he tells the guy that lives, he said, look, when you go back, you be sure to remember me. So I can get out of this place, okay? So please do that. You know, I helped you with a dream interpretation. Now help me back. When you get to the, the, the leader, you make sure you tell him about me so I can get out. So the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph but forgot him. I know you've never thought this, but you're thinking, where is God? Two of us think that sometimes. I know all of y'all, your life just saying, oh, God takes care of everything right away for me. Not for me many times. I've said that. You know, I've had that in prayer say, Lord, I know you're there, but it sure doesn't seem like it right now. I mean, okay, the hating. Okay, now I'm slavery. Okay, now I'm serving as a slave. Now I've been accused of rape. Now I'm in jail. And now I've still been forgotten. When is it going to change? And many times right here, bailout happens. You never experience your divine purpose in life that God created you for. Say, I'm done. And God's not done with you. And God has not left you. And God has not left Joseph. The timing just wasn't right. <laughs> it wasn't the right time. And I know you're like me. Lord, I, we got to get this thing moving because whatever I'm going through, things have got to improve. And they don't. And they get worse. And the worst. But you know what? He didn't let that derail him. You never see once where he complained about God. He just says, okay, he forgot me, but <clears throat> I'm going to keep being faithful in this chief jailer position. And the last point, he saw things in light, or the next to the last, in light of how God is working in his life to fulfill his divine purpose. You have to do that. You got to say, okay. All this is happening, and I've got to see it in light of what God is doing in my life to fulfill my divine purpose. You know what we usually look at? Our focus is, woe is me. This sure doesn't look good. Okay, but what's your next thought? Okay, God, I've got divine purpose, and how is this showing me what it is? Otherwise, you're missing life's purpose. God's doing all this for a reason. He's got purpose and he wants you to use it. A lot of times we find the purpose and still don't fulfill it. Just like all I need is things to get better. That's all I need. 
that's not what God wants. He wants things to be so that you're used for his divine purpose. That's the purpose. Not just for your better, but for his better, his glory, his use for such a time as this, for his kingdom. That doesn't mean that he doesn't love you, but he wants to use you in maybe a do, new and a better and a different way than he's ever used you before. But maybe you're not paying attention. Maybe I'm not paying attention. We know that now the cupbearer finally remembers. Oh, yeah, because the king said, I've got this dream, and I can't interpret it. I, I, I don't know what this dream means. And then the cupbearer like, oh, oh, I forgot about this guy in jail, uh, this Joseph guy. Won't you call him up? So he did, does, and he gives the dream, and Joseph, of course, interprets it, you know, and said, hey, there's going to be seven years of good times and the seven years of famine, and you better prepare for the famine with the seven good years. And so he interprets and even tells the king what he needs to do. And so Pharaoh's like, he says to Joseph, since God's informed you of all this, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and according to your command, all the people shall be your, shall do homage. Only in the throne I will be greater than you. So Pharaoh says to Joseph, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. This is the greatest nation on earth. There's no nation greater than Egypt. And you're the number two in command. Everybody will do what you tell them to do in the entire nation. Wow. Long road from pit to palace. 13 years actually. But he made it. He didn't make it. He did these things so that God could get him where he needed him for his divine purpose. To keep the children of Israel from starving to death. And God will do that for you because there's things that God needs done on earth even right now. Of course, we could go in and on and on about, and this is a big Reader's Digest version. He ends up, of course, his family is starving too. So they have to come into Egypt for food. And so, lo and behold, who's over the food distribution? Their brother. Of course, they don't recognize him, but he recognizes them. Oh, we got a little different scenario here. Oh, Joseph could have cracked his knuckles and said, oh, <laughs> revenge is sweet. But he didn't do that because he had divine purpose. And so long story short, there's a lot of instances that happen back and forth and back and forth. We won't go on through all that. But basically, he ends up now revealing himself to his brothers. And so we see how that response goes. I am your brother Joseph. I like, I like this little quote, just in case you forgot. Whom you sold. Remember? <laughs> I'm the guy you sold. They knew who Joseph was. I, I like how he put that little comma in there. Whom you sold into Egypt. Now do not be grieved or angry with yourself because you sold me here. For God sent me. Before you to preserve life. And then in verse 7. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant in the earth and to keep you alive by a great deliverance. In verse 8, now therefore it was not you who sent me here, but God did it. Is that how you and I would have responded? Don't worry about a thing. All these things that were done to me negatively and wrong and hateful and spiteful and wrong accused, God did that, allowed that to happen so I would get here. Hmm. You know what he was doing? He lived with divine purpose. Of course, of course he saw it that way. Why we get so bitter and angry? Because we don't see it with divine purpose. He just said, I live with divine purpose, so God's going to head me to divine purpose, so you don't need to worry about it. It was God who did it all. He allowed it to happen. He wasn't, I mean, he didn't say be mean and do all those things, but God did it. God sent me here so that I could save lives. And then the last point. He practiced forgiveness to continue to fulfill his divine purpose. A lot of people start with divine purpose, and they keep moving through these five steps toward that, and then they get to this last one. They say, I can't get past this one. I see so many people that can't get past this one. Now, what happened was these brothers, their dad dies, 
And so they think, oh no, dad's, dad is dead, and so now he's going to really get revenge. The only reason he's held back on us is because daddy was going to get on to him. And now that daddy's gone, so they come up with this concoction. Let's tell him that daddy said this before he died to make sure you make sure you forgive your brothers. <laughs> oh, man. Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we're your servants. But Joseph said to them, do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? Let me explain this, for I'm in God's place. Joseph's mom and dad, that's Rachel and Jacob, were married and Rachel couldn't have any children. And she was upset, rightfully so in that culture too, and won't have a baby. She just couldn't have a baby. And so she goes to her husband and tells Jacob, this is his mother telling, this is Joseph's mother telling Joseph's father, obviously before he was born, give me children or else I die. Then Jacob's anger burned against Rachel and said, am I in the place of God that's withheld the fruit of the womb? These words mean the same thing. What he was saying up there at the first time is to say, only God can take vengeance on somebody. And if God wants to take vengeance on you, brothers, then that's between you and God. I'm not in God's place. And his dad was saying, only God opens and closes the womb. That's God's business, not mine. Here, here's a note. You can put this off the side. This is a marital note. Try to understand your spouse's motive. He got mad at Rachel instead of saying, honey, I know how you're feeling. That's, it's a bad situation. You really want to get pregnant. He shouldn't have got mad. But he did answer correctly in the sense of it's God who opens and closes the womb. And Jacob was saying, vengeance is not mine. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. When we don't forgive, we put ourselves in God's place. Oh, that's, I even hate to say those words. And saying, no, this is my business. God, you get off to the side. I'm doing this. Woo! That almost gave me goosebumps. To not forgive is punching God over saying, I will take vengeance. I'm in God's place. Whew, that, that almost sounds like blasphemy to do what only God can do. Now, we can, but we're not supposed to. And, and that's how uh, Joseph looked at it. It's like, I can't take God's place and do something negative towards you guys and take vengeance. I don't want to take God's place. If he wants to do something for y'all or some vengeance or whatever, I'll let him do that, but I'm not. Matter of fact, he did just the opposite. As for you, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve the people alive. So therefore, don't be afraid. I'll provide for you. And he spoke comfort to them and kindness. He Bring them all in. Bring your children. Bring your livestock. I want to take care of you. I want to give you the best land. Wait, Joseph, have you got a mental illness? These guys sold you into slavery. I know. I want to do some good for them because God used them to bring me here. Uh, I think we better send you to a doctor. Because you, you're not responding rationally. He would tell you, I know I'm, I'm responding biblically because I want the blessings of God. I want to see God's blessings. I want to see God work in me the way he's done from the pit to the palace. I want him to keep doing that from now on. Why would I do anything to hinder it? I want it to keep on going and if I start taking God's place, It'll stop, so I just want to see it keep going. A lot of people say, nope, I'm not going to do that, and it stops right there. And you miss all the things that God wanted to do in you and me, and we don't see it from there. And he said, I just want to provide for them. I'll just do as good as I can do for them. You know, that is the best way to get over something. The Bible says, you know, when somebody's done us wrong and we do them right, it's like putting coals on their head. 
They said, well, I'll put the coals on their head. I mean, that's no problem. No, what that meant was that's the best way to bring them to shame is if they've done you wrong, do them good. Do them good. Go find something good to do for them, and you'll get over it as fast as you ever could. And, boy, I'm sure this even helped him. Come on, guys. I'm going to give you the best land, the best this and the best that. I'll do whatever I can to set you up. I'll, I'll send the moving crews out to go bring everything back. Just tell me what I can do. Don't you know that helped him get over it too? And also helped him continue to fulfill God's purpose. I conclude with this verse, which you know quite well. We know that God, we know that in all things, God works the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. The Amplified Version says this, all things work together and are fitting into a plan. What plan? Your divine purpose. Because you've been called according to his purpose. And if you're doing that, he will work all the, you see, there is a prerequisite. Oh, it's all working for my good. You can't claim it like that. A lot of people claim what they shouldn't be claiming. Let's claim the whole verse. If you're going to let what things are going in your life work, you've got to claim the whole verse. Okay, what's the whole verse, Pastor Tim? Well, okay, that all the, for, oh, to those who love him. And if you really love him, you're going to want to be used for his divine purpose. And they've been called according to his purpose. So you've got to put all that together. It's just not a blanket deal. Okay, it's going to work together. No, it's going to work together for good. If you're loving him and you're wanting to be called according to his purpose, you're saved and I want to be used by him. Man, that, that and so, so Joseph is like, he was saying, okay, I'll mix the selling into slavery, the being serving as a slave, and I'll be wrongly accused, and I'm going to take that uh, accusation that got me in jail and then being forgotten and God just stirred that up and worked it out for good because now I'm in the palace number two in command you know we've said this before you know most ingredients in a cake you don't like by itself I mean anybody in here ever eaten uh, bacon powder that's not you, you just eat salt by itself you know you have me just love flour just get you a good spoon of flour you know, you know, raw egg, most people, somebody says, I love her. Most people don't like raw egg, but man, when you take that up, raw egg, flour, nasty baking soda, all that stuff, and mix it all up, and mix and mix and mix, and work that stuff all together for good, and put it in heat. Then your trials get heat. And put it in there for 350 for 30 minutes. Put some icing on that bad boy. That thing worked out together for good. What you didn't like individually, you sure liked when it worked out together for good. And it stayed in that oven just hot enough for what the chef that made the recipe said. Just hot enough and just long enough. Nobody got that. I got to repeat it. The chef said, how long and how hot? Not too hot, not too cold. Not too short a time period and not too long a time period. Just the right time and just the right temperature that the chef said so it would turn out not burnt and not doughy, but just perfect. That's you and I and our trials. To work out things together for good will be just the right heat. Not too much, not too little. But a lot of people miss it because they got through the last trial and what are they doing? Thank you, Lord, I'm still on my own, having my plans and doing my own thing and, and God has nothing to do with it. His church is not better, his service is not better, his ministries are not better and you go on to the next one and say, thank you, Lord, when he says thank you but use what you did for my divine purpose and we forget about God and we forget about what he did. And the deal is working out for his purpose, for his plans, and for all that he does. And so we've got to look and say, Lord, I know you're working this out for good, but it's working out for good, for also your good. Did the last thing he got you through make you a better servant for him? Did it, you make more commitments to him? 
Did you do more for him? Were you more faithful to him? I used to be a teacher. You know, we had what we called summer, summer school. If you didn't learn it then, you're going to learn it in the summer. And kids hated that. And it was enough punishment, so to speak, to say, I think I'm going to learn most lessons the first time now. But Christians go to summer school 14 years in a row sometime, and they still had not learned to say, I think I'm going to use this for God's good. <laughs> and then they see it's for their good too. Because there's nothing better than finding your divine purpose in life. You say, is God going to send me to a palace? God's going to send you where he needs you for you and for best for him. He's going to direct you to where he wants you to be if you're listening. And doing these five or six steps to be able to get there. We saw David get there when he, called, when he killed Goliath. We saw Joseph get there so he can save his people from starvation. And each of these people we're going to look at, they all had a lot in common of how they fulfilled their divine purpose. And the lessons we learn from them, we can fulfill our divine purpose. That we won't be just mirror people and ladder people and swing people. We'll be the food people. They're saying, yes, I can. my life has a lot of elements. But no greater element is being used by God. For his glory. For such a time as this. Until he comes back. I want to be found faithful. And see what all God can use me for. While I'm here. I'll be helping others. Others will be helping me. And we can all find our divine purpose together. As we go through this life. Our life could end tomorrow. Our life could have another 50, 60, 70, 80 years. I don't know. Whatever we have, we have. And we got to use it for his honor and his glory. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd stand to your feet. And during this time, we set aside a time to, to ask the Lord, uh, just now that we've heard his word, to really apply it to our hearts and lives. To say, Lord, how did you speak to me? Not to my neighbor, not to my wife, not to my children, but... What did you speak to me? And so it allows us a time of application to his word. And so right there where you are, take that time to do business with the Father. Maybe you've never come to know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, so that's the first thing to do to find your divine purpose is to be saved. Realizing that you're a sinner separated from God, that no amount of good works could ever gain heaven because only perfection can enter heaven and you need a Savior who's perfect and that perfect Savior is Jesus who died on the cross for you so that you would have eternal life, who, who at salvation would gift you with the Holy Spirit so that you would have power to live for him. And to live that supernatural life through the power of the Holy Spirit. If that's never happened to you, that you've never been born again. You've been born once because you're here. That was a physical birth. But if you've never had your spiritual birth, then you're lacking. Jesus said you must be born again. And so we give that opportunity each and every Sunday for those that never have known Christ as their personal, personal, that it never happened to you personally, then you can do that today. There'll be people at the altar that can share with you how to know Christ. Others of you know Christ, but maybe there's something in these six points that's lacking, something that the Lord has shown you and me that we need to make corrections so that we can fulfill our divine purpose praise the Lord that he brings us that conviction and we can confess it to him and he'll just make that right and that we can get right with him conviction is something he does for our good condemnation is from the devil those that are in Christ Jesus there's no condemnation the Lord wants us to grow and move forward in Him. 
till he comes back, which I believe is soon. He's preparing his bride. He's preparing his church to be all that we can be in, during these last days. And so whatever the Lord's spoken to you, just confess it to him and get right and walk in freedom and liberty. We don't walk in condemnation. That's from the devil. We walk in victory. Father, we just come to you, Lord, right now as we confess how much we need you. Father, we pray through the power of the Holy Spirit as we have this time of invitation, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just move and we'd see you work in the hearts of lives and people, Father. God, we just want to hear from you. May you be glorified in it all. As Gary plays, maybe you just want to pray where you are. Maybe you want to come to the altar and pray. Maybe you want somebody to pray with you. Maybe you've been coming to the church and you want to join. Whatever the decision is, just do business with the Father. As Brother Gary plays, you just respond as the Spirit leads. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste. of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Father in the evening. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy and whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. All is at rest. I am my Savior. I'm happy and blessed. Watching and waiting. Filled with his goodness and lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior. And renew a right spirit within me. Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. And renew a right 
spirit within cast me not away from thy presence so long take not thy holy spirit from me restore unto me joy of thy salvation and renew a right spirit within Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your presence and your anointing, Lord God. You're so good to us. We thank you for this fellowship we have, Lord, the love for one another, Father. And we just pray that we'd be that faithful church that Revelation talks about, that would be faithful in the last days. Father, we thank you for our love for one another, and I thank you for their love for you, Lord. And as we move forward, Lord God, may your spirit just continually to flood this congregation for your honor and glory, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. 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 You may be seated. Just got a few closing announcements, and then we'll uh, go from there. All right. First of all, is a, uh, our first announcement is we're planning a surprise party for Sister Kathy, uh, Brother Joe's wife, Kathy, at the spring campus. You say, well, is she going to watch the telecast? No. Brother Joe said he'd be faithful on vacation to say, that's about all we need to do there. Let's turn the channel so, so that she wouldn't. So uh, uh, if you'll uh, put that down and not say anything to anybody because it is a secret, uh, keep that under wraps. And if you'd like to participate in that, uh, Friday, August 18th at the Spring Campus at uh, 7 p.m. And uh, so... Help us celebrate Sister Kate's birthday. I heard that today is Ruby's birthday is what somebody told me. So praise the Lord. So, so we praise the Lord for Ruby and uh, blessing she is. And so uh, anyway, so the first three, four letters there are shh. So keep that one uh, under wraps. Also to our first time guest, uh, well, let me hit that. And that one's up there now. Baptism service is going to be August the 27th. So if you haven't been baptized since coming to know the Lord, this is your opportunity to take part because we're just opening it up. Uh, remember, if you got baptized uh, before you came to the Lord, you got wet, okay? Maybe you said, well, I got wet back then, but I really need to get uh, baptized. Biblical baptism, obviously that's by immersion because it's a picture going down, death to self, rising up to follow Christ, then uh, if that's you, then get a hold of me and say, hey, put me down for that one because I've really never been scripturally baptized and I need to be a part of that. So we're making a big day of it. We're just going to try to baptize a lot of people. So see me uh, about that and we'll get you uh, signed up and, and part of that. Amen. Uh, also, as the next one, you are a guest. Uh, to our first time guest, if you... Uh, Filled out one of those cards. Take that card with you out in the lobby. I'd like to meet you and greet you. I have a gift I'd like to give you, and so it won't hold you very long, but we're so glad that you're here and a part of what God's doing at Believer's Fellowship. We're uh, trusting God as he grows our fellowship to just be able to use us in greater and greater ways. So we're so grateful that you're here, and so I'd like to get a chance to visit with you out in the lobby. So if you'll just stop by and do that. Also, don't forget your uh, tithes and offerings. Be faithful to give. We do, it does support the ministries of the church, and God's given us faithful stewardship over his money, so you can see the ways to give up on the screen. Uh, school starts back here pretty soon, just a few more days, and so uh, we wanted an opportunity to pray, um, so we are going to have an opportunity that also on Tuesday, uh, the school district's meeting with all the teachers and in all the school employees that can be there at the event center, and they've invited the pastors to come and pray over them as well during that uh, Tuesday meeting, but we want to do that here for our students and uh, our school employees. So we've asked our kids, if you're in school, if you're in high school, um, any school or teacher or employee, won't you just, uh, won't you get the kids to come up here anyway? So we'll get them to come up. We'll get them to line up here. And if you work for the school district or a teacher, won't you stand where you are? Because we want to pray for you as well. If you work in any capacity in the schools, because you're all important no matter what you do. If you're working for the schools, we need each of you to, we'll have a word of prayer. So uh, be, continue to pray for our schools. Amen. The, uh, we just, there's uh, 
it's a new era in life, and we need to be praying for our teachers, our administrators, our people that work in maintenance bus, the whole gamut uh, need our prayers. And so uh, these young people here, they're standing here, let's be lifting them up as well because they're, uh, they're going through. So also, if you're a student, we want to pray for you as well. So uh, let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, as the school starts, uh, these young people go back to school. Father, we pray for them. We pray a hedge of protection around them, Father. We pray that you would just minister to them this time, and Lord, that they would just uh, be strong in you. That, Father, that they would take the gospel into the schools, Father God, that they would stand firm, Lord, with any temptation like Joseph faced. Father, they would stand and say this would be a sin against God, and that they would flee temptation. So, Father, use and minister to them, Father, to be the light in those schools. Father, we pray for every teacher and every worker in any capacity in the school district, Father God, that you would use and minister through them, Lord. We thank you that they've committed their life to serve our children in whatever thing that they're doing for the school, uh, whether they're in administration or maintenance or teaching or bus driving and the whole gamut, Lord God, that you would... Uh, you would just use them and minister to them, give them strength and stamina and wisdom and discernment, Lord God, and hedge them up as well, Father God, that you would just use them in a mighty way. And we thank you for them and their service to our community through what they've uh, committed to do in their life, which is to serve our children. We pray you'd bless them, Father God, in a special way. Father, we love you. We commit this to you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's give these here a big round of applause. So Y'all can go ahead and be seated. All right. So. All right. You leaving? I'm not leaving. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to leave to the lobby. <laughs> yeah. so, so, do you want me to leave? So anyway, no, I'm just teasing. Uh, so anyway, uh, somebody left me extra batteries. I guess they thought I maybe really would go long. So. <laughs> So I didn't, I didn't go too long. So I guess that I had extra ones, I guess, if I needed it. So Brother Gary, why don't you close us out? Yes. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to sing happy birthday to Ruby back there. But she's not even here, is she? No, she, there she is. <laughs> Staley, thank you so much. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ruby. Happy birthday to you. Dismissed.